Hello everyone, we're back again with another critique video today on the channel. We have Dr. Ben Bickman. Now, I say that these are critique videos because that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm criticizing, but criticizing doesn't necessarily inherently mean that the person is wrong. Ben Bickman is much more advanced than most people in the health space because he understands the role of hormones. He understands that. It has nothing to do with calories. Binge my channel to find out why that is, but I respect that. But I couldn't help but notice that just a few days ago, five days ago, he released a a video entitled The Randall Cycle, or at least Insulin IQ released a video called The Randall Cycle, How Your Body Chooses Between Glucose and Fat with Dr. Ben Bickman. And I have not watched this video, but I found it very, very compelling in terms of my desire to watch it. But it's also making me, if I'm being honest, incredibly nervous because most people will get this wrong. So we're going to jump directly into this and see what he has to say and see if it is correct or not. But first, before we do that, just like always, please subscribe to the Patreon if you haven't already ready to gain access to one week early uploads, ad-free content, unset insert content, and one extra video per week. And also buy my book Contraindicated if you have not already. And with that being said now, let's jump directly into this video. Welcome to the Metabolic Classroom. I'm Professor Ben Bickman, biomedical scientist and professor of cell biology. Thanks for joining me. In the lecture today, we are discussing the concept known as the Randall Cycle. Now, anytime you hear a name of something, it's named after the person who discovered it or discussed it most thoroughly, perhaps, is the better word here. It's also known as the glucose fatty acid cycle. The re Which is interesting because Randall himself, when he drew the cycle out on his original 1963 paper, I believe, maybe 1965, it was really a glycerol fatty acid cycle, not a glucose fatty acid cycle. But anyway, we don't really know what he was thinking because he was his own man, so... I'm devoting time to talk about this in a metabolic classroom is because it's something that's been used, uh, it's been invoked, I can, uh, I think, somewhat inappropriately or incorrectly in certain social media um, channels. And so, but it is a perhaps an interesting idea. It's one that I think has value in helping us understand. Actually, not perhaps. Yes, it absolutely has been, especially by people that are of the Ray Pete fan base. They do a lot of inappropriate extrapolations, it seems. Metabolism, a little better. And of course, hopefully there's some nugget in there that can influence habits to help us, to help you, all of us, make better decisions when it comes to nutrition. And again, ultimately, just getting a better understanding of how our body works and the metabolic function within it. Now, I'd already mentioned the alternative name, the glucose fatty acid cycle, named after Philip Randall, who first really identified this with his colleagues. Um, this was decades ago in the mid-60s um, at Cambridge. And Dr. Randall and colleagues, when they published some of these papers, and I'll have a link to some uh, really highlighting some of their seminal work in the show notes, um, what they wanted to do was understand fuel utilization in the heart. So it's important to note that that was the model for their experiments. Uh, in yes, sure. Since then, what we have seen is that the Randall cycle is actually not a cycle at all and is a cross inhibition between fatty acids and glucose, an enzymatic inhibition, cross inhibition. And so any cells that present with the enzymes that are present within or that are involved within that cross inhibition are subject to the same effects, even if it is not cardiac tissue. There may be limitations to this because heart is a unique tissue. Uh, there aren't a lot of tissues that operate metabolically like the heart does. Now, having said that, I don't mean to, I don't mean to cast shade on the idea, on any of the ideas that we're going to discuss. I believe they have value, but we need to appreciate the model, um, which again was perfused hearts from rats. So a a a, a heart would be. Uh, surgically removed from the rat and it would be kept alive and beating. So nourished, properly nourished, and then infused with through the blood system with nutrients, of course, glucose and fatty acids, and then analyzing the metabolism of these substrates or what's being used. Now, already I've made, I've mentioned a, a word a couple times that you need to understand, which is fatty acid. We all know what glucose is. Fatty acid is what is used for energy, however, that tissue is pulling it in, whether it's pulling it in as a direct free fatty acid, which always is coming from fat tissue, and that becomes an important point that we're going to highlight in this lecture, or whether it's a fatty acid that is pulled off of a triglyceride that is circulating on the blood as it is 
lumped into a triglyceride rich lipoprotein like ldl cholesterol or vldl anytime you get yeah, vldl primarily i believe yes blood tests and it's giving you a triglycerides number the triglycerides are just a part of ldl or vldl they're not yes free circulating molecules like free fatty acids are so regardless in the experimental model they're infusing free fatty acids which is something i've used in my own experiments um, but in the body just appreciate the fact that those fats that are getting metabolized could be coming from either free fatty acids which are coming from the fat tissue the fat cells breaking down their own fat namely lipolysis or it's coming from the actions of lipase which is pulling off a fatty acid from a, a passing triglyceride molecule which itself is in a, a lipoprotein like ldl or okay, so what, yeah, basically that is how you derive fatty acids from your food because they're packaged up into first chylomicrons and then they go through the lipoprotein metabolism cycle. You actually could call that a cycle, but it's a continuous cycle and then they get packaged up into VLDL molecules, which then turn into IDL molecules and then LDL after going back to the liver. It's this whole thing. So yeah, that's basically what he's referring to. So yes, correct, which isn't a surprise coming from Dr. Ben Bickman. LDL. Boy, well, that's a heck of a start, isn't it? I'm already getting pretty complicated. And that is, for better or worse, a bit of a theme of today's lecture. This is admittedly for a little bit, it's focused a little more for kind of biochem nerds. And I wouldn't have discussed this if I didn't think there was a growing general interest in the topic. It's very likely by now, if you've been swimming in the waters of even kind of social media, metabolic research or metabolic science, you've heard the term Randall cycle. All right, now, all of this has been sort of a history and a teeing up of the topic. At this point, you might not really even know what it is. In general, the concept is simply one to explain this substrate competition. No, it's not competition. Glucose and fatty acids are not competing for utilization at the mitochondrial level. What it is is a cross inhibition of the two substrates. This is one of the most common and also one of the most understandable mistakes that people make with respect to the Randall cycle. Usually when you explain that to someone, they sort of come around to your way of thinking anyway, and they say, that's basically, that's a better term, that's what I meant. But I want to get the verbiage right because it's not a competition. It's a cross inhibition. It is an enzymatic cross inhibition between fatty acids and glucose that occur simultaneously when fatty acids and glucose enter a cell. Represented as two individual graphs where one substrate is inhibiting the other, but one must understand when observing those graphs and assessing them, or those graphics really, that both are occurring simultaneously, which is what causes the inflammation of the cell in the first place. In other words, how do we understand what, which fuel a cell is relying on? Well, that is usually determined as inferred by the Randall cycle phenomenon by what that cell, in terms of the mitochondria really, is oxidizing primarily at that given instance in time. Something in motion tends to stay in motion until something external imposes a force to make it stop, or in this case, switch over. There is inertia involved. It fits that law of physics right there. So if the mitochondria are primarily oxidizing glucose, well, then it's going to continue oxidizing glucose primarily unless something significant enough imposes a significant enough force to perturb that equilibrium reaction in the other direction. So that's really how it is selected for. That is how fuel selection works in the mitochondria for the most part in the case of glucose and fatty acids. During a Randall cycle cross inhibition situation, any fatty acids and all ketones that can permeate or administer themselves into mitochondria passively, so not through the CPT1 transporter, can still do such a thing. And so that's, that's a different story. But in terms of fatty acids and glucose, the mitochondria will tend to be oxidizing one or the other based upon what it has been oxidizing primarily, as inferred from this entire phenomenon, this entire system here, anyway. With the primary fuels at most cells being the cell choosing between using fats for fuel or glucose for fuel. Now, if we were being really, really thorough, we could include other fuels. There are more than just fats and glucose that provide energy to a cell. We could talk about ketones, and I will actually bring up ketones at the end. Right, and I just cover that. If I follow my unscripted notes a little bit here um and even lactate which is really a yes a derivative of pyruvate it's the reduced form of pyruvate but for another time lactate is a very viable fuel for many cells so there are a lot of 
other particularly during exercise. Notice how Ben Bickman responsibly and accurately refers to lactate as lactate and not lactic acid, by the way, because of the fact that lactate exists as lactate at physiological pH and not lactic acid. For some reason, it's largely accepted in the scientific community that you can refer to either a proton acceptor or a proton donor as an acid, irrespective of the form in which you will find it in physiological pH. I think that's ridiculous in my opinion, but maybe it's the pedant in me. Energy sources that we could highlight, I'm focusing on the main ones, the ones that provide the vast majority of energy to a cell and most cells, namely fats and glucose. So again, the Randall cycle is this concept to explain this phenomenon of, of energy use at a cell or bioenergetics. That is true. Where you can't, the cell isn't going to use both. If the cell has access, if there's more fats available to the cell, then glucose, no surprise, it shifts its metabolic function to rely on fats as a- There you go. See, Ben Bickman is proving himself to be a responsible, competent scientist here by representing properly the paper. There are so many people in this space that do not understand the Randall cycle, but pretend to, Raypedians specifically, to claim that fatty acids are somehow a problem and that you shouldn't be consuming fats. It's just nonsense. Primary fuel source. If there's more glucose available than fats, no surprise, the cell will shift its um, metabolic processes to rely more heavily on the glucose. As One note that I want to add, though, is the verbiage again. If there is more glucose available, I think what he's referring to is to the cell specifically, not in the blood. And that's important because that actually depends. It depends whether a cell will choose to oxidize glucose or fat. Choose, so to speak. Choose implies volition, and we know that it's all just chemistry in the body, but we'll use that for the sake of the argument. Sort of like preferred fuel source. Well, it's not that it prefers anything. It's all chemical equilibria that we're talking about. It has no volition. It doesn't choose. But but again, for the sake of the argument, we use that verbiage. It depends actually on what the cell once again is oxidizing at that time. So if he's meaning if there's more glucose available in the cell than fat, yes. And vice versa, if there's more fat compared to glucose available in the cell, then it will oxidize fat, yes. If he's talking about in the blood, available to the body in the bloodstream, in the plasma, for example, that's different. That's actually not necessarily the case because of the Randall cycle, actually. It's a complicated situation, but he gets it so far primary fuel. Now let's get into this in just a little more detail. That definition would be sufficient for just a lay understanding. You now know- Yes. Basically what I say, because it is a complicated situation, a complicated chemical phenomenon, is that fatty acids and glucose cross inhibit one another and they cause a slew of issues in the body when consumed together subsequently. Therefore, that's all you need to know from a lay person's perspective. I love getting into the granular stuff though, and I have a feeling that we're going to do that. So let's do this. I And look at this, look at the title on the screen, reciprocal inhibition. There you go, proper verbiage the Randall cycle essentially is, or the glucose fatty acid cycle. It is this competition between substrate or- uh, It's not competition though. Sources at the level of a cell. This kind of battling between glucose and fat. But that's not what's happening. It's not a battling. That's not what's going on. It's an act of cross inhibition. Because you see, if that cross inhibition were ameliorated, that enzymatic inhibition, then those substrates actually wouldn't be competing for each other. The mitochondria would just use immediately what is immediately outside of it, irrespective of whether it's a fatty acid or a glucose molecule. If it's a glucose molecule, they don't care. It'll use it. If it's a fatty acid, it'll use it. But the cross inhibition is what makes it appear to be that way. And that's not what is actually occurring. And I'd like to get more into the cross inhibition and and the subsequent effects of it because the subsequent effect of that in a cell is necessarily inflammation slam dunk. And I'd like to get into the mechanisms later on. Now, how does it happen? For those who don't want the kind of biochemistry mechanism, by all means, just sort of skip ahead for the next five minutes or so or speed it up. Um, but it is pretty brief and I'm going to just touch it at a pretty high level. Now, this is a reciprocal inhibition. So there you go. There's more fats. It's demanding its own burning and it's generally shutting down the glucose burning. If there's more glucose, then it's demanding that it gets burned and it's sh shutting down the fatty acid oxidation or the fat. Absolutely correct. I love how Dr. Ben Bickman is actually exemplifying that this occurs with both substrates. Both of them inhibit one another. Vegans will reference this Randall cycle and only cover half the story, which is that fatty acids can inhibit glucose oxidation because it can. Yes, sure. If the cells are oxidizing glucose primarily, but notice vegans, what substrate in this cross inhibition situation is locked out of the cell? It's only glucose. Fatty acids just pull in the cell, in the cytosol. You can see it in the graphics. I wonder why that is. Anyway. So it can go both ways. And so 
without any particular order in mind, let's just discuss it first and foremost from the side of the fat getting burned. And why not start with that? Because that's the fuel that most of us would prefer to be burning for the sake of just maintaining body weight. After all, good luck controlling your body fat if you're not burning fat. First and foremost, fatty acid oxidation inhibits glucose utilization. So when correct are is when there's an increased number of free fatty acids in the bloodstream, it will increase the uptake. So the, the uptake of free fatty acids will be increased, no surprise, into mm, once again though, if you're talking about the bloodstream, not necessarily. Because what if you're someone that consumes primarily glucose and therefore is oxidizing primarily glucose because you're not eating a lot of fat and then you eat a mixed meal of fat and carbohydrates. It could be the case that, yeah, that could switch on their mitochondria to oxidizing fat. But what it, what seems to actually occur, if we're going to speculate here, because this is all speculation, to be fair, the fat that they consume will pull in that cell and will be inhibited by the glucose oxidation. A lot of that glucose from the bloodstream will be sequestered because their cells are primarily oxidizing glucose. And then the cells will be fully replete with substrate. And so glucose will still continue to pull in the blood and circulate and cause damage to the red blood cells, the epithelial cells, until space is freed up, so to speak and then they can sequester more substrate from the bloodstream. Either way, once again, this is why we just say at the end of the day, all you need to understand is that they cross inhibit one another and you need to choose one diet or a diet that has one of the major macronutrients and is very poor in the other. One of those diets is completely replete with all the nutrients you need for the subservience of your life. And the other one is completely destitute of those and bereft of them. Cell. And as the fatty acids are coming into the cell, the story's not over yet. It sort of gets activated and it turns into a, a, a fatty acid it gets bound to another molecule that kind of locks it in the cell. Be yes, it's through the CPT1 transporter. It's carnitine that he's talking about. You'll see this phenomenon in biochemistry a lot where a molecule is administered through a transporter, but since it is a bidirectional transporter, it needs to be chained so it can't leave the cell. Glucose 6-phosphate is a perfect example of that. In the case of fatty acids, that is fatty acyl carnitine. Carnitine is then recycled to be used again and again for the same process. Fat so readily comes in, the fat could readily go out. So once there you go comes in, there is some immediate biochemistry that locks the fat within the cell. Yeah, carnitine. Then it starts to commit to the pathway of what's called beta oxidation. Now the yes, four step process that occurs in the mitochondria. It seems to require more oxygen for that, however, interestingly, and it seems to be a little slower of a process. Fortunately, for cells that don't have very good antioxidant status, they can readily use ketones, and so problem solved, right? Ox because ketones don't have that same problem. Oxidation itself is really loaded and sometimes used inappropriately. When I'm referring to oxidation, I mean that the fat is getting burned for energy. Sometimes people refer to oxidation as a fat turning into a harmful molecule. To be a little more precise, that... Ah, uh, yes. Good point. Yeah, when we talk about fatty acid oxidation, we're not talking about things like turning the fat into a harmful molecule through oxidation. Oxidation is simply a term that means the loss of electrons, and it can derange the molecule. But we say that substrates are oxidized because for it to be converted into energy, they also need to be oxidized, you know, loss of electrons and all that stuff, because NADH and FADH2s are the ones that take the electrons to the electron transport chain. Anyway, good distinction. I never even thought to make that. The word should be peroxidation when we refer to fats becoming these uh, molecules of oxidative damage. Lipid peroxidation, yeah. The primary molecule that is the result of lipid peroxidation and the lipid peroxidation product that is most common is aldehydes. Ben, you should look into the fact that glucose itself is a six carbon aldehyde. It is an aldohexose and damages cells the exact same way that regular aldehydes do. It's interesting. It's covalent binding. That should technically be called peroxidation, anyway, just as an aside. So when I'm saying oxidation for the purpose of this lecture, I'm talking about the molecule getting broken down for the sake of producing energy or ATP. Now, again, back to the fat. If, if, if the fatty acid is getting burned, it's going through beta oxidation. As a result of this, it's producing two important molecules, acetyl-CoA and NADH. Both of these molecules, acetyl-CoA and NADH, will inhibit a very critical enzyme in glucose burning. So at the end of normal glycolysis, this is really deep stuff. So hopefully I'm discussing it in a way that 
you can understand and if my it's honestly frustrating how complicated it is for people that actually understand it because it's almost impossible to simplify it enough for the layperson. it's extremely complicated and so it's it's frustrating that it's so complicated i wish i could just be like don't you understand but no i am putting out a lecture i'm recording one today actually about the randall cycle for a one coach peter who is creating his own course when that is out i will let you guys know and you guys can sign up for it i have four courses that will be coming out one about the randall cycle one about gluconeogenesis, ketones, and uncoupled mitochondria, one about fiber, and one about vitamin C. So keep that in mind. Goals are met, even share it with someone else. It's always my, my hopeful outcome. Um, so at the end of glycolysis, at the end of glucose burning, right when the glucose wants to go into the mitochondria, it uses this complex enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase pda yes it is a three enzyme complex it's a three-part enzyme complex you've got pyruvate dehydrogenase and then two others i, I honestly do not remember their names because to me it's relatively insignificant but yeah pyruvate dehydrogenase so normal glycolysis or glucose burning gets down to pyruvate and then if the glucose burning is going to continue and go into the mitochondria it has to go through this pyruvate dehydrogenase complex Again, when you're burning a lot of fat, you're creating a lot of acetyl-CoA and a lot of NADH. And the NADH is particularly important for the electron transport chain or system, I call it, um, which we're not going to talk about. That's entirely too complicated and not overtly relevant to this lecture. Again, you're burning a lot of fat, you're producing a lot of acetyl-CoA and a lot of NADH, and those start to both together inhibit pyruvate dehydrogenase, PDH. Indirectly, actually, it's through PDH kinase. It stimulates PDH kinase, which inhibits PDH, the first enzyme in the PDH complex. Yes. Pyruvate dehydrogenase is inhibited. Now fats, uh, now glucose can't be fully kind of broken down. Even still, that's the last step of normal glycolysis before the glucose burning goes into the mitochondria. Also, when you have a lot of fat burning, you start to create a lot of what's called citrate, a molecule called citrate within the mitochondria. Citrate then can come out of the mitochondria and inhibit an enzyme further up on glycolysis, on that glucose burning pathway. So we now have two points of attack where when you're burning a lot of fat, well, not only that, you're referring to PFK1 and PFK2, it also inhibits GLUT4. It prevents glucose from even entering the cell. If you look at the other sort of adjacent opposing pathway, fatty acids are not prevented from entering the cell. They're prevented from entering the mitochondria because it can't use it. It's because fatty acids in a cell, in the cytosol, are completely innocuous. They're benign. Glucose inside a cell is vastly toxic. The Randall cycle is a mechanism by which the cell protects itself from damage. You are inhibiting one of the steps at, towards the end of glycolysis and then another step in the middle of glycolysis. So it's some of these yes. products. So when you're burning a lot of fat, you're making various metabolites or metabolic byproducts. Then these byproducts, not while being part of an essential part of fat burning and ultimately getting energy from fat, they also end up having this influence to tell the cell, hey, you're burning me right now, stop burning glucose. Not Correct. Now, why is it that this cross inhibition occurs only between glucose and fatty acids? There have been no other established cross inhibitions between the substrates, not between glucose and alcohol, not between fatty acids and amino acids or something. Amino acids aren't really oxidized. You know, why is that the case? It's because the body primarily uses glucose or fatty acids for oxidation and it prefers one or the other because it's not just simply a cross inhibition that is innocuous or benign. It causes issues in the cell. It causes inflammation where that's happening. It's happening at PDH and the other enzyme that was a little further up, kind of at the midpoint of glycolysis. In fact, it's a critical regulating enzyme, which is what just, it's a long name. It's PFK1. PFK1 gets inhibited as well. So that's- And PFK2. Discuss it. If you want to- You inhibit glycolysis in the liver, you stimulate gluconeogenesis. Talk about this in, um, in, in various- circles because you're really bored and you want to impress someone with your knowledge of metabolism that's how you could discuss it uh this part of it at least remember we've only covered one part of this kind of reciprocal uh, inhibition namely how fats inhibit glucose burning and when you have a lot of acetyl coa and nadh and citrate which you do all three of those will start to accumulate as you are burning a lot of fat for some extended time they will start to inhibit pretty quickly actually and despite what I said, I said for some period of time, I mean, it's pretty quick. If As those molecules start going up, 
they will inhibit the cell's ability to use glucose. Now, as I said, it's reciprocal, meaning this is this thing can go two ways. It's not just fats that are kind of beating down glucose with a club. Now, glucose can too. Sometimes glucose holds the club and, and it's the one in charge. So now let's sort of flip this coin and talk about how glucose utilization can inhibit fatty acid oxidation. So when we have high levels of glucose, it will increase glycolysis and increase pyruvate. When we continue with this, increased glycolysis will end up resulting in the increase of another CoA molecule, this time not acetyl-CoA, but a molecule called malonyl-CoA. Now, yes, melanyl CoA once again is the necessary precursor for fatty acid synthesis in cells that can perform such a process. Absolutely. And you consume a lot of glucose, you have regular spikes in insulin, and you possibly have a higher homeostatic insulin level, even in a fasted state. That actually makes it to where it's more conducive for the cell to produce melanyl CoA in the first place from this mechanism, if you consume primarily glucose. So let's say you have a mixed meal and you're primarily carnivore, and your cells decide to oxidize the glucose and cross inhibit the and inhibit the fat, which, I don't know, maybe that would happen, maybe that wouldn't. The chances of malonyl coa being produced, I don't know. Maybe instead you just get increase in thermogenesis more than, more than fat storage, or fat creation, rather. It's a vastly complicated chemical process. It's insane, which is why, once again, the general gist is fatty acids and glucose cross inhibit one another, and they cause a slew of issues in the body when consumed together, therefore. Still the CoA that they have in common, but they're different molecules. In fact, malonyl CoA is made from acetyl CoA. So yes, through acetyl CoA carboxylase. Continue to burn a lot of glucose, you start getting more and more malonyl CoA. Which, by the way, is stimulated by insulin and citrate. Malonyl CoA actually goes right to the mitochondria and shuts down the enzymes, an enzyme complex called CPT1, which is now correct for the mitochondria to pull fats in. So fats need to be burned in the mitochondria, whereas glucose have both an external mitochondrial burning and an internal mitochondrial burning. And yes, and that's also very important with respect to cancer. It's the entire reason why cancerous cells depend on glucose, because in cancerous cells, they invariably necessarily have dysfunctional mitochondria. They can't oxidize fatty acids. Fatty acids are exclusively mitochondrial in terms of their breakdown. Glucose is not, because glycolysis has a cytoplasmic element. The 10-step the, the process of glycolysis is in the cytoplasm, which is why in cancerous cells, you get the production of lactate. They derive their energy from the ATP yielded from glycolysis. Pyruvate that's left over can enter the mitochondria, so it must be converted into lactate and migrated out of the cell. And then it can be picked up by a non-cancerous cell for oxidation. If you're curious as to how much more glucose cancerous cells depend on as compared to normal functioning cells, it's about 40,000% more. It's insane. PDH is the kind of intermediate, that pyruvate dehydrogenase complex that I mentioned earlier. That's how the glucose progresses from burning outside the mitochondria then finishes all of its burning in. Mal uh, CPT1 is how the fats get burned at all. There's no, if you can't get a fat into the mitochondria, it's not burning. And so when, when you have a lot of glycolysis, you start producing a lot of malonyl CoA and then malonyl CoA shuts down that entrance enzyme. So now the fats can't get into the mitochondria to be burned. And that's it. That's the one point really of regulation. So it's a little more simple. That's the one point of regulation. However, malonyl CoA is the backbone for fatty acid synthesis. So it will use those fatty acids that are in the cell that can enter the mitochondria for the synthesis of new fat. It'll use the fatty acyl CoA molecules, basically, because that's what it is in, in a cytoplasm. And it'll, anyway, thus to be stored. Um, then the reciprocal regulation that I'd outlined earlier, where with fatty acid oxidation, it's regulating glucose burning at a couple different points. Glucose burning is now inhibiting fat burning at only that one point. It's inhibiting CPT1, and it works because fats have that one singular kind of entrance. There's, it's not as complicated. There, nothing happens really until it can get into the mitochondria. Okay, now, as outlined in Randall's experiments, and the only thing people ever talk about is what I've just talked about, albeit perhaps with a little less detail, but the principle is still there and it's accurate, the way I've heard it described in general social media circles. Yes, yeah, so far Ben has got it 100% accurate. More fats results in less glucose burning. More glucose results in less fat burning. 
even at that superficial level, it's helpful, it's important. Even then, you can start to see why I don't like the old adage of you are what you eat. I prefer this more accurate adage of you burn what you eat. If you're eating more glucose, no surprise you're burning more glucose. If you're eating more fat. Fair enough, yeah. In the absence of glucose, of course, I mean, then you're burning more fat. And the However, right... it's hard to say what it is in a mixed meal situation. I don't know. Cycle kind of makes some sense of that. However, it's not that simple. And even random... No, it's not that simple. It is not that simple in terms of its effects. In terms of the application, that being that fatty acids and glucose cross-inhibit one another, yes, it is that simple. And that's not an oversimplification. That is absolutely what it is. It's cross-inhibition. And one thing that Ben hasn't touched on here that I really want to touch on here. When the cross-inhibition is occurring between fatty acids and glucose, they are occurring simultaneously. That is the thing that we need to understand. Those two graphs that he's referring to, a lot of times it's just looked at as, you know, one's happening and then... And then in the case of the other, the, the other one would be happening if you're eating more fat or if you're eating more glucose. When you have a cross inhibition situation occurring, it doesn't matter if you're using more fat or if you're using more glucose in the cell. When the cross inhibition occurs, it is between both substrates, which prevents, absolutely prevents any of the substrates from entering the mitochondria. And so, yes, the thing that causes this cross inhibition is a buildup of acetyl CoA, but as a subsequent effect of the cross inhibition, once that occurs, you get a decrease in acetyl CoA concentration in the mitochondria, which decreases the amount of ATP being produced, which subsequently increases commensurately the amount of PI, inorganic phosphate in the cell, and the inorganic phosphate within the mitochondria and increased inorganic phosphate concentrations within the cell necessarily stimulates the activation of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Fat storage is necessarily associated with inflammation. There's a reason for that. Yes, there are other reasons too, like the fact that glucose is inflammatory and causes inflammation, therefore above a physiological concentration within the bloodstream. There's that, but this is also a reason. It was the last thing that I got my head around. Around. Both of those inhibition pathways are occurring simultaneously. Now, the Randall cycle ameliorates itself in a cell relatively quickly until more substrate comes in and then it happens again and it happens again, but not fast enough for that inflammatory cascade to occur or to not occur, rather. Self and his colleagues, colleagues never suggested it was that simple. So where people stop there, they have done a misservice. Um, a disservice, not only to anyone who's listening to them, but even to Dr. Randall and his colleagues. Well, I've, I've read Dr. Randall's studies extensively multiple times on the glucose fatty acid cycle, and you are correct in saying that he did not say it was that simple. But he also said a lot of other things in his paper, particularly the very first one, where he called it the fatty acid syndrome and pretended like fats were the problem and not glucose because it prevents the oxidation of glucose in the case of diabetes, and that's what's causing diabetes in the first place. He said a lot of things, so... Because they went a little further and looked at the role of hormones. Now, before I get into that, imagine a situation where both substrates are high, both calorie sources are elevated. Not calorie sources, not in terms of the body. In the case of a bomb calorimeter, then it would be a calorie source, yes. Imagine a situation where the person has both high... Well, you actually do produce calories from those. You just don't use them. Imagine a situation where the person has both high glucose levels and high free fatty acids. How does the cell know what to do? Does it look at both and just sort of give up and say, I'm happy? Good question. Let's see what he has to say about it. I can't choose between the two of you lovely substrates. I don't know who to give the rose to, uh, to burn. How does it decide what happens then if both are elevated? Well, what's going to happen is the insulin glucagon ratio is going to play a role here. Absolutely. Here's the other thing that Randall suggested may be the case. He posited it, and I don't think it has ever been proven or experimented on. The Randall cycle cross inhibition that we're referring to can happen in beta cells of the pancreas, the cells responsible for secreting insulin. We know that. What he suggested is that fatty acids, when the cross inhibition occurs between fatty acids and glucose, may augment an insulin response to glucose. We absolutely know that people that have a hyperglycemic spike tend to exhibit not not only a trough back to normal homeostasis, but actually a trough that goes too far. They get to hypoglycemia, which entices them and elicits them to eat more, usually glucose, and then they spike it again, and the, and the phenomenon continues. What we don't know is why the pancreas decides to do that. Why is the insulin secreted not commensurate in some of these people? It's actually too much. Well, Randall suggested that the cross inhibition between fatty acids and glucose in beta cells can augment an insulin response to glucose. That may very well be the cause of it. And so if you consume a mixed meal of fat and carbohydrates together, 
sure that very well may be one of the causes of hyperinsulinemia. Hyperinsulinemia really is the is the result of the cross inhibition of fatty acids and carbohydrates in all of the other cells, though, because glucose can't enter it. Now, since everything in the body is an equilibrium reaction, if you vastly increase the amount of insulin secreted via like an injection, for example, you can override that effect and force glucose into the cells, sure, but then the cells incur damage and they sustain damage because of it, because they're purposely preventing the entry of glucose into them. Very important that we talk about it because, Ben, I've heard your rhetoric before, and it seems to be the case still that you think and talk about insulin resistance as a pathology. It's not a pathology. It's an adaptive physiological response to this cross inhibition. It's the only reason why insulin appears to stop working. It's not tinnitus or something against insulin. It's this cross inhibition. Why does it take longer or like decades in some cases for diabetes to develop or insulin resistance to develop then if people can be consuming a mixed meal for a long time? Well, activity levels play a role, but also the rate at which cell division can even occur in the first place. That slows down as you age too. So anyway, back to what he was saying, insulin to glucagon ratio is what's going to play a role here. The answer is in endocrinology. There is a little known hormone that ends up telling the cell. If we look at the whole body level, and Dr. Randall included this in his work, we need to remember that if we go beyond the experimental model, which in this case was isolated perfused hearts, and look at the whole organism or the whole body, the cells aren't acting in isolation. How does one cell know what's going on with the rest of the body? How is a signal conveyed to it from the rest of the body? It's hormones that allow different parts of the body to talk with other parts of the body. Can you guess which hormone influences the use of the energy sources? Can you? I think I just did. Yes, yes, you're right, of course. If you're thinking that it's insulin because you know me too well, you're absolutely correct. Even the Randall cycle in the original experiments in the mid-60s looked at insulin and found that insulin had a tremendous role on dictating which energy source was used. It plays a critical role. It's not the only one, but it is extraordinarily important, and I would say it's the most important. So here are some of the key parts of that. And then we're going to look at some full physiological examples to really highlight the importance of this. So with insulin, we have the promotion of glucose utilization. Insulin does not want to burn fat, to, to put it in a, in a bit of a silly way, as if insulin has some desire. Insulin, its actions um, coordinate to prevent the body from burning fat. It wants the body to use glucose as a fuel. It does so when it docks to its insulin receptor on a cell, all of its biochemistry at that cell is going to be, well, there's so much that happens. Insulin does so much. Much of it, the metabolically focused aspect of insulin, the nutrient focused aspect of insulin is going to promote the use of glucose. Now, if it is tissues that need insulin for glucose uptake, it will ultimately open those glucose transporters called GLUT4. If a tissue has GLUT4, the glucose transporter number four, then it needs insulin generally in order to act. That's tissues like muscle and fat. And that matter. Yes, actually, in the presence of hyperglycemia alongside insulin, glucose will utilize GLUT4 on muscle cells. In a hyperglycemic event, so to speak, in the absence of insulin, GLUT1 will be used on muscle cells. That's often not talked about either. It's pretty interesting. It has to do with KM values and all that stuff, michaelis menten equation type things, but anyway. A lot, because most of what we're made of is muscle and fat for the average individual. For almost everyone, it's muscle except for the profoundly obese, and in that case, of course, it's fat. But even in the average individual now, it's still generally muscle and fat mass constitutes the majority of their mass, and they're insulin dependent for glucose. Um, so they need insulin in order to open those, glu those glucose transport doors, the GLUT4 doors. So insulin does that directly. But even in tissues that don't have GLUT4, like the liver, the liver GLUT2. need insulin to tell it to take in glucose but it yes it influences km values yeah but usually they regulate their uptake of glucose by glucose's concentration in the blood they also regulate their amount and activity with respect to glucose concentration not insulin concentration still needs insulin to tell it what to do with the energy every single cell of the body will follow that pattern even if insulin isn't directly controlling the the direct movement of the nutrient in, like glucose, it's still directly controlling what the cell does with the energy, including the Randall cycle. So not only is insulin Correct. stimulating the either direct uptake or the keeping of the glucose, 
and activating other enzymes further down, like PFK1 I've mentioned earlier, hexokinase, which is the first step of glucose, locking it into the cell, whether it's going to get burned or turned into glycogen, insulin activates that too. So it generally is promoting... And it inhibits GLUT4 though too. It inhibits the transporter. Glucose, glycolysis. At the same time, it's inhibiting the breakdown of fat. Now there's two parts here of fat to talk about. Lipolysis, which is the breakdown of fat from the fat cells to be shared. And then there's the oxidation or the burning of that fat. They're not the same. Yes, that is not the same. Insulin actually inhibits, I believe, triglyceride breakdown at the level of adipocytes because glucagon is responsible as well as epinephrine and norepinephrine, but those are usually in like crisis situations. We usually talk about glucagon. Glucagon is responsible for acting upon an enzyme, which then acts upon an adjacent enzyme on the cell and it breaks down the triglycerides into individual fatty acids. I can't remember the names. That's a lesson in biochemistry entitled mobilization of triglycerides and it's a short one and it's a pretty terse one and I just don't remember the names but it's a pretty simple mechanism. Glucagon is responsible for that so I don't know if it's the case that insulin itself inhibits that reaction or if it's just the case that if insulin concentrations are higher than glucagon that it would just be less likely to occur. I don't know. People say fat burning they sometimes only are actually referring to the breakdown of the fat which is more technically to be called lipolysis. Uh, yes. So there's two steps here. It's the lipolysis or the releasing of the fat. And then there's the burning of the fat, which is the oxidation part. That's when burning should be used most appropriately. Insulin inhibits both of those. It inhibits yeah. lipolysis and it directly inhibits fatty acid oxidation. When we're talking about inhibition by hormones, we're usually talking about phosphorylation reactions. It doesn't want the fat to leave the fat cell. And even if there is some that's left the fat cell, it doesn't want the tissues like the muscle to burn the fat. So insulin is absolutely... Which makes sense because insulin is an anabolic hormone, building up and storing things like fat and um, building muscle, but you actually don't need that much insulin for, for muscle protein synthesis and the mobilization of amino acids as, as people may lead you to believe. For understanding which fuel is going to be used. If insulin is high, it will both aggressively activate all of the glucose burning pathways and aggressively inhibit any of the fat breakdown and burning pathways. In contrast, if insulin is low, there is a much diminished signal to burn glucose and there's nothing to stop fat breakdown and burning. So now fat breakdown and burning is just going nonstop. It's going unchecked. There's nothing really to inhibit lipolysis. Other people want to invoke other little hormones here and there. And other can mat others do have an influence, but nothing matters if insulin is low or not there at all. And we're going to get into that in just a moment. We're almost there. And so again, just to really put a fine point on it, if insulin is high, the body is burning glucose. And if insulin is low, the body is burning fat and glucose burning is shut off. This is this happens even if both are elevated. Insulin dictates which one is used. Now with that point in mind, I, can, I wanted to be able to give you a real physiological example of this point. And diabetes is the perfect example, both type 1 diabetes and type 2. Of course, the difference with them, and there's far more different between type 1 and type 2 diabetes than there is similar. I will state this again, as I've stated it before. I think it's a tragedy that they're even put in the same family. The only thing they have in common is the high, the high blood glucose. Everything else is profoundly different between... Correct. Extremely different. However, type 2 does tend to trend towards a type 1 phenomenon, basically. Even if you don't want to call it type 1 diabetes. It basically is, actually. It can. Absolutely. Because of the fatiguing of the beta cells, which influences the insulin to glucagon ratio. And then you've got higher glucagon than insulin, despite a hyperglycemic event. And then you've got serious issues. Because glucose will not enter the cells as readily as it does with insulin. It is an absolute problem. So, But I think it does need to be addressed, though that even if insulin, yes, it'll influence the, the cells to take up glucose instead of oxidizing fatty acids, it takes more insulin than usual because the cells are purposely preventing the entry of glucose into them by insulin. They call it hyperinsulinemia, and it's true. They get it wrong when they call it insulin resistance, usually, because the way that they describe insulin resistance is some sort of cellular tinnitus, and it's not tinnitus. It is a purposely done and performed disallowance and prevention of glucose administration.
by and at the behest of insulin. So it takes more insulin. It's a very multifaceted issue, but once again, fatty acids and carbohydrates cross inhibit one another and they cause a slew of issues in the body when consumed together. Choose a diet that is very rich in one of those macronutrients and very poor in the other. Therefore, one of those diets is replete with all of the nutrition that is required to subserve the life of a human being and the other is not and will cause a slew of issues down the line in the form of catastrophic health failure born of nutrient deficiency. They shouldn't be even lumped together. They're diseases of opposites. They're not diseases of similarities. With type 1 diabetes, there's too little insulin. With type 2 diabetes, there's too much. All right. No, there's not too much insulin in type 2 diabetes. There's too much glucose. That's the problem. That leads to an excessive amount of insulin, but that's not too much insulin. That is exactly the amount of insulin required at that given instance in time by the body. It's not too much insulin. It's too much glucose being shoved into the throats of those people. Okay, that's the pathology at hand. It's glucose consumption. The pathology isn't type 2 diabetes. The pathology isn't insulin resistance. It's glucose consumption that's the pathology. Type 2 diabetes is not born of too much insulin. It's born of too much sugar. Now let's talk about type 1 diabetes first because it provides the most extreme example here. And it's a perfect scenario where both glucose is high, the person is profoundly hyperglycemic, and guess what? Free fatty acids are also through the roof. They have both, they have extremely high levels of both substrates. So it's the- This is a good example, yeah. And then they produce vastly too many ketones, basically. Or really, once again, not too many, exactly how much the body deems to be appropriate. But it causes ketoacidosis because they make solutions acidic. They lower the pH over time, if present in a high enough concentration. Anyway. Sort of case study here that I um, alluded to earlier. How do we reconcile this? And when there's no insulin, which one is the body using? So this diabetic body, again, tons of glucose. It's using fatty acids and ketones. That's what it's using. The fatty acids, the cell can't choose which one. And so who helps it decide it's insulin. And if insulin is present, then the cell would know, okay, I'm burning glucose. If insulin is absent as it is in this case, even though both are available, both substrates, glucose and fats, insulin, if it's absent, like it is in the untreated type one diabetic, it can't stop burning fats. It can't stop. It's just burning fats like gangbusters. In fact, it starts to burn fats so much that it can't. So if you take a tissue like the liver, where the liver doesn't need insulin for, say, glucose uptake, but again, it needs insulin to tell it what to do with the energy, it's burning so much fat that it starts to get to a threshold, if you will. And I'm describing this a bit imprecisely, but I think it's helpful nonetheless. Normally, a cell is only burning as much energy as it needs ATP, the main mo a molecule of energy. In the case of basically every cell except for brown adipose tissue. Well, actually, that is actually kind of energetic for the cell to use to get work done. Whatever the cell wants to do, it's ATP that allows the cell to do it. So normally, this, the burning of energy is demand-driven. The cell saying, hey, I need this much ATP. And so the cell will say, okay, no problem. I'm going to burn this much fats or glucose to give you that much ATP. But if insulin is absent, firstly, the liver is primarily burning fat, but then it can't stop burning. There's nothing to really turn it off. And so even so the cell, again, this is a little imprecise. It's met all of its energetic needs where the liver is saying, hey, I'm I'm full. I'm getting all the energy I need. Um, so now so probably it goes to ketone production because that's usually what happens anyway that usually happens because of the fact that oxaloacetate concentrations decrease as a result of gluconeogenesis and so acetyl CoA cannot combine with that oxaloacetate to form citrate and therefore it goes through another pathway which is the production of ketones which are basically little pieces of fat if we're being extremely accurate they're called ketone bodies and then they get ushered into the bloodstream because they're water soluble and then they get taken up by any cell that requires requires ATP readily at that given instance in time. And it's far faster and requires far less oxygen than fatty acids do to oxidize and, and convert into energy, so to speak. You don't convert it into energy, but it's used to create energy. But you get too many of those and you will perturb the pH balance of the blood. And that is deadly because when you, well, decrease the pH of your blood by a few units, so to speak, we're talking about logarithmic scale here though, your enzymes will not work properly because the activity of all substrates and chemical solutes I guess you could say, is dependent on the pH of the solution in which they are in. That includes the cell fluid, that includes the blood. The cell, which still can't stop burning fat, starts to turn it into ketones. Yes. So ketones are kind of this release valve where the liver cell is saying, 
one, I don't need any more energy, but two, I can't stop burning fats for energy. And so three, I'm going to start changing this energy into something else that other parts of the body can use ketones, particularly the, 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 the brain, of course, but every tissue, every cell with mitochondria will gladly use ketones for fuel. And of course, yeah, up to about 60 to 70% I've seen of the brain can utilize ketones for its fuel. It does still need glucose though. And that's another huge issue with type one diabetes. And also fun fact, it's been said that fatty acids cannot permeate the blood brain barrier just ubiquitously universally. They can't. That's not true. Most of them can't. There are plenty that can pass right through there. It's not preferred though. And there's many reasons as to why that's the case. But anyway, in the case of the diabetic, this is generally trying to make up for what is perceived to be a lack of glucose. Even though glucose is through the roof, in the absence of insulin, the cell can't really use it. It doesn't know what to do with it. Yeah, particularly their muscle cells as well as their fat cells. But like you said, insulin is not only required to usher glucose into GLUT4 cells, it also is responsible for regulating the activity of the other GLUT transporters to some degree. However, I don't know to what degree that is because I was taught in biochemistry that that is more so dependent on glucose concentration, not on insulin concentration. Maybe we can discuss that. Ben, I will tag you in the title of this video. Maybe we can, I can have you on the channel or vice versa. I would love to do that. So, and we can talk about this because I like nerding out on this stuff too. I think it's really interesting, but also important. So in the untreated type one diabetic, both glucose levels are high and fats are high. There's nothing to turn off the use of fats. So fats win at the same time. There's nothing really to tell the cells to use the glucose because it's almost like the cells can't see it. It needs insulin to tell it what to do with that glucose. So the cell just- Right, and that's why I try and stay away from the word see and perceive and prefer and choose because they don't have a volition. Because if they did, they would be able to see the glucose outside and go, hey, hey guys, we need to take this up. Anyway. It sees the glucose and says, yeah, sorry. I just don't know what to do with you. So don't come in. I'm not gonna store you. You just keep circulating in the blood. Insulin hasn't come and told me what to do because there is no insulin. So this is, it should be, generally proof positive of the importance and indeed critical aspect of insulin when it comes to understanding the Randall cycle. If people are trying to discuss the Randall cycle in the absence of insulin, uh, it doesn't work. Um, there's really- Well, it works to some degree because once again, insulin is not as effective of a regulator as I think that you are making it out to be with respect to the amelioration of this cross inhibition or, or some sort of switch over to glucose from fatty acids or something that prevents the damage that would be incurred from hyperglycemia that results from the pooling of glucose in the blood that results from the prevention of glucose from entering the cell. It's the entire reason why insulin resistance is a thing. Despite the excessive insulin in the bloodstream or the, the perceived excessive insulin, it's exactly Exactly how much the body deems to be appropriate. The glucose still can't get into the cells. It's the entire reason why that is the case. So once again, if you vastly increase insulin via like an injection or something, you can override that reaction, just like what you're saying. But usually the cells will protect themselves first. It will choose that, choose that. It is a genetic pressure, so to speak. If we're going to be extremely, you know, accurate with our words, not, not choose, but it's, it's a pressure that has, you know, evolved as a pressure for as long as our genes have existed, which is billions of years. So, so especially for however long our species has existed, inclu including proto-humans that preceded our current speciation. So four and a half million years then, it's a pressure. No, there's no true understanding of the Randall cycle or this competition between substrates, fats and glucose. Well, okay. I mean, we have enough of an understanding to know that they cross inhibit one another and therefore shouldn't be consumed together. Oh, um, there is also that there's, I've been talking about it from the level of burning, but if we go one step back up, of course, there's what's happening at the fat cell, which is that in the absence of insulin, we can't stop breaking down fat. Um, so that no surprise in the case of the diabetic, the person's losing an extraordinary amount of weight. And this is something I've alluded to before in various outlets, namely the- Oh, but but Ben, it's just calories in, calories out. It's just calories in, calories out, Ben, right? Well, I mean, that's what Lane Norton says. Lane Norton's really smart and stuff. He's also extremely humble and respectful. The, the phenomenon of diabulimia, which is when a type one diabetic, uh, before they're diagnosed, they've become quite used to being able to eat whatever they want and be really, really skinny. Now they feel miserable. They're dying in this state where their ketones are getting into the realm of acidosis and their hyperglycemia is destroying blood vessels and nerves, but they get used to being thin. And now when they start taking their insulin injections, they aren't. They start gaining fat very, very quickly.
they learn this. And unfortunately, in some instances, it leads to them abusing that fact and continuing to eat whatever they want and simply deliberately underdosing the insulin to stay thin. This is because if insulin is low, they can't stop burning fat. Thus, they're as thin as they want, albeit um, pathologically so, unfortunately. All right, now let's shift the topic then and talk. Uh, look at how, what happens in type 2 diabetes. Interestingly, in type 2 diabetes, as I said before, that's when we have too much insulin. No, it's when we have too much glucose being consumed. It has nothing to do with insulin. Type 2 diabetes, in terms of its etiology, has nothing to do with insulin whatsoever. Well, it has something to do with it in terms of, of the expulsion rate, so to speak, of glucose that's introduced. Sure. But in terms of the actual cause of it, insulin has nothing to do with the cause of it. Insulin is a regulator, but it is not the cause of diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is a situation where you have a lot of insulin. Sure. But phrasing is important here. So this should be resulting in the cell shifting only over to glucose burning. And there is still some glucose. And it can because it has that inertia little thing that we were just talking about and that you've been talking about the last 10 minutes at least. But what you also have seemed to respectfully fail to mention is that hyperinsulinemia results from this. But if what you're saying is true, where if you increase the amount of insulin in the bloodstream, that'll force the glucose into the cells, which is true if you inject a ton. But if that were true when it comes to physiological secretion by the body, then why does the hyperinsulinemia not result in invariably glucose being ushered into the cells. It's because the cells are protecting themselves from damage. There is a strong force against that glucose introduction, despite insulin's presence. You have to vastly increase it. Also, from my understanding, insulin is not an inhibitor of gluconeogenesis, which is why the liver continues to release glucose into the bloodstream via that process, via the Randall cycle phenomenon as well. You've got fatty acids that inhibit glucose oxidation in liver cells, so you're inhibiting glycolysis. If you inhibit glycolysis, specifically PFK1 and and specifically PFK2, you are helping to stimulate gluconeogenesis. Not to mention the fact that acetyl-CoA itself is a stimulator for gluconeogenesis. There you go. Burning, but because of the insulin resistance, it's... Cr On top of that, by the way, the increase in ADP that results from this cross inhibition in the mitochondria, ADP also stimulates gluconeogenesis, I believe. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. ADP stimulates glycolysis. But it doesn't matter how many stimulators of one pathway versus how many stimulators of the other and inhibitors of both pathways are active or not. It just depends on the degree of inhibition, the degree of stimulation. That's why these little reductionist graphics of like, this inhibits this and this, it doesn't necessarily give you an idea of what the result is because that depends on the degree and in other words the power of the inhibition and or the stimulation of each respective pathway it's all ratios that's why ben doesn't talk about insulin and glucagon values he talks about insulin to glucagon ratio because that's what actually matters same thing with inhibition and stimulation seems to be the case that the liver doesn't stop releasing glucose from gluconeogenesis in hyperglycemic events at least not invariably so it's the entire reason why metformin was produced yes to bring glucose levels down but also it inhibits glucose production at the level of the liver it's via the exact exact same mechanism. What is that mechanism? Look into AMP activated protein kinase. And uh, if you're intuitive enough, you'll understand how that's actually harmful to the body. The unique, a unique, very odd scenario, which is a little more nuanced than is it than it is in the case of type one diabetes, because there's more tissues involved in different ways. So insulin is high, but as the body has become insulin resistant, the fat cells are rightfully so, as it should. Insulin resistance is the Randall cycle being activated. The fat cells are altered in their responsiveness to insulin. In fact, the fat cell, I argue, is one of the first, if not the first, tissue to become insulin resistant. No, 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 no. Okay, so now I know what his argument is, and I understand why he's making it, but it's not true. And I actually really would like to have a conversation with Ben on this. Lobby his channel, please. I would like to talk to him because what he's saying is that, oh, well, once a cell becomes insulin resistant, then it fails to respond to insulin, and so it continues to oxidize fat instead. Okay, no. The insulin resistance is a result of the cross inhibition. It's an active result because the cells are purposely preventing preventing the entry of the glucose into them. That's what's going on. And also, once again, both of those inhibitions are occurring simultaneously, which causes inflammation via a decrease in the redox potential. It has to do with the NAD, well, hence redox potential has to do with NAD to NADH ratio. You get a decrease in that ratio, the cell will become inflamed, rightfully so. So you've also got inflammation of your fat cells. The Randall cycle activity of a cell is not influenced by insulin resistance. It's the cause of it. Normally, insulin would be telling the fat cell to hold on to its fat. Insulin is saying to the fat cell, hey, I'm not going to let 
other tissue. I'm not going to let the muscle use you for fuel. So just keep it in the fat cell. You just store that fat because I'm telling the muscle right now and the fat cell to use glucose for fuel. That can, or you're trying to, but some of the cells are preventing the entry of it. And so you get a pooling of glucose in the blood associated with hyperinsulinemia. It'll happen to some degree. There is still some glucose utilization happening. Yes, which is explained by the Randall cycle, some, but not all. Because remember, there are some tissues that don't really need the insulin for glucose uptake and some degree such as the kidneys such as the liver such as the blood brain barrier such as fetal cells red blood cells yes insulin functioning is sufficient to allow some glucose burning but the, the high fat the, the high insulin is having this weird effect because remember insulin resistance is two things it's both insulin not working well like we have at it's not that it's not working well per se i just covered that the cells aren't responding to it purposely at the fat cell where it's not inhibiting lipolysis anymore so the fat cell is breaking down fat so free fatty acids are higher but the insulin may still be sufficiently working at the muscle to tell it not to use the fat so one yeah but this is all determined by the energy status of that cell all of it which is why insulin can seem to work on some cells but not others just a quick note here this is actually what ben bickman at this point in the video seems to be referring to this is sort of a renewed version and demonstration of what randall meant by a randall cycle in the very very beginning of this video i showed the cycle as exactly how randall depicted it however this is a different one from a far Far, far later written paper in about 2009 you can see that plasma glucose plasma just being the liquid part of your blood exists and it has the ability to enter adipose tissue to be converted into pyruvate through glycolysis if that is happening that will prevent triglycerides or triacylglycerols that's the other name for it from being converted into long chain fatty acids obviously because now you are in an anabolic state insulin is pushing glucose in and insulin simultaneously is going to tell the adipocyte to not engage in triglyceride synthesis or the very least will increase I to G ratio so as to lower the propensity for triglycerides to be broken down signaled by glucagon. Simultaneously if we go back up to glucose, glucose also has the ability to enter muscle cells to be broken down into energy and carbon dioxide. However in this depiction long chain fatty acids are being oxidized in the muscle cell and via the Randall cycle cross inhibition that's been elucidated that would inhibit glucose oxidation. The problem with this graphic here is the fact that it doesn't show the exact opposite being true and at least it doesn't imply it. Glucose can enter muscle cells and be oxidized into CO2, H2O, and energy, and that would inhibit long-chain fatty acid oxidation. Long-chain fatty acids, by the way, can also be oxidized into adipocytes through beta oxidation. It does have that ability, which would inhibit glucose oxidation into pyruvate. None of this really has to do with insulin, because in both of these situations, insulin would not be able to force the glucose into the cells unless you vastly introduced insulin into the body. That's why insulin resistance occurs in the first place. Place. Insulin resistance is a physiological adaptive response to this cross inhibition evinced by the GLUT4 transporter being inhibited by acyl-CoA in the graphics. Muscle is extremely metabolically active, which may explain why in a Randall cycle activation in the body, insulin is more responsive to muscle but not fat cells. Fat cells aren't very active at all metabolically, particularly white fat. Muscle cells are. And the bigger they are, the more active they are. So that's one of the reasons why people say that the more muscle mass you have on your body, well, the better you can hedge against diabetes development if you are consuming carbohydrates, and, and the better that your body can withstand the insulting, that's what it really is, of glucose consumption, or any carbohydrate for that matter, but particularly glucose because fructose is metabolized differently. And we come to this scenario where in the type 2 diabetic, we can have high glucose and high free fatty acids. Yes, what they need is to eliminate the pathology, which is the glucose consumption. But if they have a fatiguing of their beta cells over time, so a training towards type 1 diabetes, then glucagon is higher than insulin, or at the very least, insulin is just lower. And so then you can get even more blood glucose pooling and glycation damage, and also more glucose production at the level of the liver through gluconeogenesis. You can get this whole swath of, of issues happening. At the end of the day, for a lay person, what do you need to understand at this point in the video, in my video? Definitely don't mix your macronutrients together with respect to fatty acids and glucose. Glucose. And if you actually mix a meal with protein, fat, and carbohydrates, well, Ben Bickman would know because he did a lecture on it. You can vastly increase your I to G ratio by consuming protein with carbohydrates. So then you've got a huge issue. But anyway, in terms of fat storage. Anyway, let's keep going. In general, 
the type two diabetic is primarily using glucose and can't shift out of glucose burning. This is something I've alluded to before called metabolic inflexibility. Now well, there's no reason that someone should be metabolically flexible at all, actually. You know, a great way to impose a shift over to the other system, that being beta oxidation, is, uh, well, eliminating the carbohydrates because then you perturb the equilibrium balance of the cells. So there you go. You want to do it sensibly and prudently. It may be far more difficult for someone that already has type 2 diabetes to do it. Maybe if it's extremely progressive, but uh, it'll still work because that's the pathology. Stop consuming the carbohydrates because that is the pathology. Anyway, we're almost done. Metabolic inflexibility is nothing more than the high insulin altering the Randall cycle, the glucose fatty acid cycle in a healthy individual. But what you've also got going on is a cross inhibition of the substrates, which prevents insulin from acting upon the cells. I mean, there you go. It's a vast thing. Get rid of the carbs. You eat a mixed macronutrient meal with fats, carbohydrates, and, and proteins. Because there's an insulin increase, you go to glucose burning. Once you've gone through that glucose, glucose and insulin comes down, and you get into the fasted state, now you're fat burning. What had been noticed... Yes, it's also important to note, though, that your ability to fast without feeling extremely hungry and lethargic is predicated upon the macronutrient that you eat the most. Because if you eat glucose primarily, or if you're primarily in a glycolytic state most of the time, what you are going to experience physiologically is a decrease in the genes responsible for producing glucose in the liver, gluconeogenic enzymes. You will also experience a decrease in the enzymes responsible for fatty acid oxidation. And so that's one of the reasons why people people continue to, they need to eat all the time. They can't fast. They eat three meals a day with snacks in between. And it's also where this myth comes from that you need to stabilize your blood glucose levels uh, for that reason. It's like, well, you know, my glucose levels are stabilized and I can go 48, 72 hours without eating. Explain that. It's because genes respond to the environment in which you place them. That is how their activity is influenced. Decades ago now is that in a type two diabetic or someone with insulin resistance, they, they are sort of stuck in that glucose burning mode that even though they haven't eaten for some period of time and in a healthy insulin sensitive person, they would have transitioned into the fat burning state of fasting. They don't, they stay stuck in glucose burning. And that's because of this high insulin that is reflective of insulin resistance. Well, we covered insulin resistance, and I've covered it on multiple occasions on this channel. The cells do not have an ability to develop tinnitus against insulin, so something is actually occurring. It's something else. And I just explained it. It's a cross inhibition of fatty acids and glucose that prevent the glucose from entering the cell, whether it is primarily in a glycolytic state or in a beta oxidative state. The GLUT4 transporter will be blocked by fatty acid derivatives, and that will prevent glucose from entering it despite insulin's presence. You vastly increase insulin, you can override that effect, but you will damage yourself cells in the long run because the cells are purposely disallowing the entry of glucose because they're trying to protect themselves. It really is that simple. And of course, that's very much reflective of type 2 diabetes. So type 1... Type, type 2 diabetes is caused by glucose consumption to some degree. Truly pathological type 2 diabetes and prediabetes, all that stuff. I say truly pathological because there have been very few, but some people that are on a carnivore diet, it seems, that can exhibit prediabetic levels of fasting blood glucose, except for the fact that whenever you do a fructosamine assay on those people, it comes back stone cold, which means they're not experiencing excessive glycation, which means they don't have truly pathological diabetes. Diabetes is pathological because of glycation damage, okay? So forget your fasting blood glucose, forget your fasting insulin, forget your HbA1c, look at a fructosamine assay and a reticulocyte production rate if you're curious about your HbA1c and what it actually is telling you. Brr, I covered this in a Dr. Suresh Kawadkar critique. Check that out. Two diabetes both reflect the relevance of insulin in understanding the Randall cycle. Now, yes, but the most important part is the cross inhibition aspect of it in terms of its application to human health and diet, especially. One, I debated on whether or not to share this, and I generally like these to be about 30 minutes. So I'll be very brief here because I think it's important, and it's something I'm going to touch on in a future lecture. So be sure to stay tuned for that, which is the relevance of insulin and the Randall cycle in altering hunger. This is particularly relevant in the type 2 diabetic. So it's I'm deliberately placing it here as we wrap up after talking about insulin resistance in the type 2 diabetic. The brain is unique. It doesn't quite fit into our understanding of the Randall cycle because it doesn't use fats for fuel. 
in general, you it can, and actually sometimes it does, but generally, informally, yeah, sure, it doesn't. It uses ketones or glucose. It has access to fats. It's, I think, more correct to say that the brain uses fats for structure. It uses it to build stuff rather than using fats to burn for energy. So the yeah, which means that fatty acids can enter the blood-brain barrier, by the way. So it's a point in the carnivore community that I think needs to stop being promulgated because it's not true. Fats can enter the blood-brain barrier, just not all of them. And honestly, not most of them, but yes, they can. Brain's fuel choices are between glucose, which is a ubiquitous fuel source, and ketones. Um, that's the brain's availability. And once again, the Randall cycle would be relevant here. A brain cell, like every cell of the body, just can't infinitely use all energy sources available to it. It doesn't need an infinite or an unlimited access to energy. It's going to choose one or the other. And, and I wanted to mention this. No, 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 no. Unless you're talking about glucose versus fatty acids. Glucose versus ketones, it uses both. And it uses mostly ketones, it seems, in a case like a ketogenic state. But the thing about glucose is that it is absolutely required by the brain. You don't have glucose in the brain, it will die. Astrocytes and neurons are your primary nerve cells in the brain. Astrocytes will use glycogenolysis, which is why there is glycogen stored in the brain exclusively in astrocytes. Neurons can only use oxidative fuel sources, so it will use things like ketones. But yeah. In the context of hunger... Because if you have insulin resistance, the brain can become insulin resistant. That there are regions of the hypothalamus that can become insulin resistant. Where yeah, sure, but it's a Randall cycle cross inhibition. I don't really like the term insulin resistance because of how much it has been poorly described. Particularly, we have our hunger and satiety centers. As that part of the brain becomes insulin resistant, it can. And what caused the insulin resistance? in glucose as well even though there's plenty of glucose in the blood the brain isn't getting it in very well and why can't it perhaps across inhibition preventing the entry of glucose into the cell i mean here's the thing it doesn't fully prevent glucose from entering the cell because <laughs> if it did that then um well your brain would die the brain cell concerned would die but anyway and also the randall cycle cross inhibition is between fatty acids and glucose and so the amount of randall cycle activity in the brain is going to be lower because the brain doesn't primarily use fatty acids at all like we just talked about and ketones are not subject to this thing however ketones are subject to preventing glucose from entering the cell at the level of glycolysis still if there's too much going into the the cells anyway the glucose isn't working well so the glucose doors aren't opening very well glute 4 isn't working particularly well well it's primarily one of the others maybe glute 1 or something i'm not sure i'll have to look into that specifically but now imagine in that same situation because of the high insulin reflective of their insulin resistance what has happened to the ability of the liver to make ketones, which is a favored fuel by the brain, or uh, of the brain? Of course, it's compromised. And so it's this particularly meta- Why is that? Let me rewind. Now imagine in that same situation, because of the high insulin, reflective of their insulin resistance, what has happened to the ability of the liver to make ketones, which is a favored fuel by the brain, or uh, of the brain? Of course, it's compromised. And so it's this particular- a metabolic tragedy, a particular metabolic tragedy where the brain, which has so much glucose surrounding it, isn't able to use it very well because of the insulin resistance. And the one fuel that it's crying out for, namely ketones, in the midst of this compromised glucose use, is a fuel that it doesn't have access to. It's not available. Um, to be a little more... Okay, well, not exactly. Because if it weren't available to the tissues of the body that require glucose, they would die. It's because of the high insulin inhibiting the liver's ability to burn fat. Because insulin is stopping the liver's fat burning, there is... Mm, sure, in an extremely high insulin scenario, perhaps. I have to look at the, the pathways again for that. From my understanding, insulin does not regulate things like gluconeogenesis, really, um, in terms of the liver's rate of doing such a thing. It regulates the enzymes responsible for it, so it can lower the activity, but it doesn't inhibit it actively. Anyway, we're getting into really complicated granular stuff, stuff that usually I have to go into a Google Doc and write down because my thoughts are so all over the place, but, and usually that doesn't happen in these videos, but this is refreshing, humbling. Compromised production of ketones resulting in the brain going a little hungry.
And if the brain is going hungry, not only can that contribute to chronic neurological pathologies like depression and migraines and Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's, all of those have this aspect of glucose hypometabolism to it. In other words, a compromised ability to use glucose. But to compound the problem, we're not giving it access to a, a, the alternate fuel source, namely ketones. So I like to sort of jokingly invoke the rhyme of the ancient mariner here, which may sound a little familiar, um, the, the sailor who's on the sea tossed um, and, and dying of dehydration bemoans the fact that he's surrounded by water, water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. He can't drink it, even though he's surrounded by water. That's sort of analogous to the brain being surrounded by glucose, but it can't get it. And the one thing it's crying. The only thing that would cause that is a cross inhibition, not a tinnitus situation because cells can't become, they can't succumb to tinnitus, to insulin. So there's something else going on. Insulin resistance is a cross inhibition between fatty acids and glucose. And if we're talking about a cell that is preventing the entry of glucose into it, then it has too much glucose. It seems to be the case that Alzheimer's disease and all these things are not insulin resistance. It's glycation damage from glucose. Now you can talk about a cell becoming insulin resistant in the brain and the fact that in Alzheimer's Alzheimer's situations, you can observe things like insulin resistance at a cell. I mean, we, we'd have to really go into deep detail on that. And I'd have to, this is something that I would have to grab my notes on and really, really think about. But I don't think that insulin resistance is what's causing a brain starvation situation. What I think is going on is glycation damage. Over the course of decades and things like inflammation that can increase that propensity for for a cell to become deranged and die inflammation from things like seed oils particularly the lipid peroxidation products in there the aldehydes in there also the deuterium that slows down the rate at which your mitochondria function at the level of atp synthase h0h1 and also the extremely high ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 that at a dose response level will cause inflammation from thromboxane production and all this other stuff inflammation 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 so for the, the 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 fresh water that we could provide this stranded sailor would be the ketones in the case of the brain to bring the analogy back full circle so there's a relevance there not only to the brain going hungry and contributing to pathologies but if the brain is hungry it thinks the body is hungry and then it stimulates hunger that's this idea of the fuel partitioning theory of obesity that i'm going to talk about in a future lecture so stay tuned. And of course, insulin being extraordinarily relevant. Okay. As usual, I talk quite quickly as I'm generally freely thinking through these ideas. I hope that some of this sticks, um, even though the biochemistry might have seemed a little daunting at first. If, listen to this again and slow it down, pause it, take a note, you know, be true students with this lecture. It'll stick. Um, but now I'm confident you know the most relevant information regarding the Randall cycle, the glucose fatty acid cycle, the reciprocal nature of the inhibition of these two caloric energy sources wanting to be used each so not caloric energy sources i mean sure they are caloric energy sources but the body doesn't use calories i'm sorry i hate to be that captious guy but it's really really important in the health sphere that we stop using the word entirely no relevance no bearing on human physiology they are units of heat energy they are kinetic energy there is no calorie transport chain there is an electron transport chain and electrons have mass one 1836th of a proton anyway let's actually let him finish up here wanting to be used each sort of demanding priority boarding onto this metabolic bus if you will um, but remember mm, that implies competition again but okay there's a conductor there's someone who's dictating ultimately which one gets to go on and be burned and that is the humble hormone insulin not only that though because if it were the only thing then insulin itself released from the pancreas by the body would necessarily always commensurately introduce glucose and administer it into cells. You have to vastly increase it. Why is that? Because there's another regulator and that's the cell itself. It is preventing entry of glucose in order to protect itself from damage. That is what it is. If insulin's up, the body is burning glucose or blood sugar. The body Not necessarily. Define up. You're burning. If insulin's down, the body's burning fat. It's fat burning. One of those is ultimately better when it comes- Same thing there. Maintaining insulin sensitivity and body fat. I hope all of this has been helpful. Thanks again, as always, for tuning in. Remember, until next time, more knowledge, better health.
All right, Ben, if you are watching this video, because I am going to tag you in the title of this, and I'm sure that some people, maybe one or two, will send you this video or something. I would like to talk to you about this because I think it's important to talk about the implications here with respect to a mixed macronutrient diet. I'll get my notes ready. I'll do all that stuff. I would like to talk to you. I think it's important because what the Randall cycle tells us is that fatty acids and glucose cross inhibit one another, and therefore they cause a slew of issues in the body when consumed together. They absolutely do. I would like to talk to you about the inflammation aspect of this. Absolutely. Because the inhibition pathways are occurring simultaneously, necessarily. They sort of go back and forth, but they are occurring simultaneously, which causes inflammation. And I would also like to talk to you about probably some other things uh, that you've talked about that weren't even talked about here. But anyway, for the viewers, besides Ben, if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like. Please subscribe to the channel. Please leave your thoughts in the comment section below. And also, once again, please subscribe to the Patreon if you haven't already. And buy my book, Contraindicated, a closer look in revision of mainstream health axioms that have perpetuated illness, disorder, and disease for over a century if you have not already. And also, the link at the bottom of the screen, what is that link? Well, that is a link that will bring you to an amazing site with amazing products from an amazing brand known as Cerule. If you purchase product through that link, you will get a permanent 10% discount and permanent free shipping on your orders when signing up for monthly deliveries. And if you email me behind the scenes at edgoki14 at gmail.com, I can explain to you how to earn those products for free because who in the right mind wouldn't want that? If you'd like to learn more about those products, products like who should take them, why you should take them, what they even are in the first place, which I recommend anyone do before buying anything at all, I would refer to the link in the top right corner of the screen, the Cerule products video, that is a complete elucidation, a complete explanation of what those products are, and once again, who should take them, why you should take them, even when to take them, etc, etc. And I would also further migrate to the description below to find a video between myself and Professor Bart K on the products in even further detail. Also, if you were someone that would not like to pay recurring payments with respect to things like Patreon or Cerule, rule payments with an auto ship, I have made available two donation links for one-time donations in the form of a PayPal donation link as well as a GoFundMe donation link, which are both also linked in the description below. And finally, email me once again at cookie14 at gmail.com if you have any questions regarding anything at all, including things that were mentioned in this video, if you have any questions about it. So, with that being said, join me next time when we react to someone else that actually does know something. Wow. It's quite rare that we react to someone that does know what they're talking about and is extremely sagacious and perspicacious with respect to human health and its implications and application to diet. So, till then.